So I'd like to invite up uh, team uh, Spirosense, is also working on a very innovative um, sensor, a uh, new approach to diagnostic grade spirometry. Um, again, working cl uh, somewhat closely with uh, some of the learnings from the graduate M Health team. So without further ado, team Spirosense, over to you guys. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Young, and I am presenting with Manu Sharma, and we are Design Team 11, developing a de-skilled spirometer for use in low resource settings. Throughout the course of our project, we have worked with our advisors, each experts in their field. We are also partnering with the CBID M Health team to implement our device in rural India. First, some clinical background. COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, affects around 30 million people in India and kills about half a million a year. This makes it the second leading cause of death in the country, and these numbers are thought to be grossly underestimated because many patients do not seek care for their, for their symptoms. This widespread undiagnosis stems from the lack of a standardized approach in assessing pulmonary function, and this is due to the high cost of diagnostic equipment and the gap in the formal medical training of rural medical practitioners, or RMPs, compared to the knowledge needed to operate certain equipment. A spirometry test, as demonstrated in the video, is the gold standard for assessing pulmonary function. The technician is very involved in coaching the patient on how to appropriately perform the test. And with training, the technicians in the kiosks can successfully administer these tests. However, spirometers cost at least 2,000 US dollars, and with the majority of rural India living on less than $2 a day, it is unfeasible for them to have access to spirometry. Without access, patients go undiagnosed and their symptoms severely compromise their quality of life. The progression of the disease can eventually lead to their death. With access to spirometry, patients can be diagnosed and placed on an appropriate treatment plan that can highly improve the quality and length of their life. Therefore, in low resource settings, there is a need for accessible clinical grade spirometry to assess pulmonary function and better inform affected patients and their providers on the necessity of treatment. After performing extensive research and consulting with our advisors, we developed the following device goals. Our device must be accurate, reusable, robust, mobily integrated, power efficient, easy to use, and competitively priced. In order to accomplish some of these goals, our spirometer must perform with at least a 3.5% margin of error as in, in accordance with the American Thoracic Society standards and cost less than $100 to produce. Our device is broken down into three parts. First is the spirometer, shown in black. Second is the electronic compartment in white. And last, the user interface. We send the signal from our spirometer to a smartphone or tablet using a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And all the signal processing occurs on the mobile device, allowing us to greatly decrease our cost. We measure airflow using a fluidic oscillator. Air enters the device and encounters an obstacle, which causes the flow to travel down one of two paths. It then alternates to the other path. This is demonstrated in the video below using water. As the flow increases in speed, the frequency of oscillations with which the water switches between sides increases. Current spirometers use many moving parts in addition to complex electronics, which make them very expensive. However, our device has no moving parts and very simple electronics, making it extremely robust. The key principle behind our device is that as airflow increases, the frequency of oscillations, the air switching between channels, increases. This is what makes our device so innovative and unique. This is a CAD model of our current prototype. Air will enter through the mount, round mouthpiece at the top and encounter a fox head shaped obstacle. Air will then travel and alternate between the left and right channels. The second part of our device measures the sound of the air in each channel using two electric microphones. The microphones are powered by a cell battery which is rechargeable using solar power. The bottom electric, electronic compartment attaches to the spirometer at the output of air. We recently sent our prototype to India, and users were excited by the size and portability of the device. Manu will now walk you through the use of our device. 
Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you about the vision we have for our user interface. So here's a video of uh, a prototype application. And the first option the user has is to select a new patient or an existing patient. Uh, from here, they'll enter in all the necessary patient information, such as the patient's name, date of birth, height, weight, and other relevant information. Let's skip forward a little bit. Uh, from here, the test can be begun. Uh, once the test has begun, it will last for around six seconds, during which time our signal analysis capsule will record audio and send it to the device. The device itself will carry out the analysis of the signal, and the results will be displayed on the screen. Uh, from here, the test can be saved or redone if the results were invalid. Um, once the test results are saved, you can view them looking through the existing patient files, uh, which you could sort through the patients and the test numbers of those patients. From here, you'll be able to send the information or return back to the menu. So let's talk about some of the numbers behind our device. So as you remember from earlier, our device's uh, keystone principle is that as you increase the flow rate of air entering the device, the frequency that it oscillates at will also increase. We needed to find exactly what this relationship was, so we used a known airflow, airflow rate, which we measured using a top-of-the-line spirometer, and then plugged in that airflow into our device using a clear plastic hose. Uh, we measured airflow rates between 0 and 8 liters per second and figured out what frequencies each of them created. Uh, the relationship was very linear with an R-squared value of 0.998. Uh, and this allows us to um, work on our signal processing, which, we work, which we'll talk about later. So here's the raw audio from our two microphones. The top graph shows the right microphone and the left microphone in red and blue. Uh, as you can see, the two signals are perfectly out of phase. So whenever one is at a trough, the other is at a peak. And uh, the first step in our processing is actually to subtract two signals from one another. And that results in the bottom graph, which is slightly amplified and also has the uh, benefit of having ambient noise removed. We pass this enhanced signal through a short time Fourier transform, and you can see almost exactly what the shape of the graph would look like with that bright yellow curve. But we need to find exactly what it is. So we found the most fundamental frequency at every time window and connected them together with a red line. Uh, that's shown here now. Now that we have our frequency versus time plot, we can transform that into a flow versus time plot using the linearity line we found uh, two slides ago. That results in a flow versus time plot as shown here. Um, now the next step is to integrate this curve over time to result in a volume versus time plot, which looks like this. Uh, from here, we plot parametrically the volume and the flow, resulting in a flow volume loop, which looks like this. And in green, you'll see a model flow volume loop. The size and shape of this graph is what allows doctors to diagnose the pulmonary functioning of a patient's lungs. So just to summarize really fast, we start with the stereo signal, subtract the two from one another to get a mono signal, pass it through time frequency analysis, integrate the result, and parametrically plot the flow and the volume to get the final output. We've tested our device with 100 trials using a pre-calibrated 3-liter syringe, the, and then we measured the errors on each of those trials, and we created a histogram of that data right here. The American Thoracic Society requires a error of, an error margin of less than 3.5%, and our average error was 2.8%. However, when we account for a one center deviation in our error measurements, we found that we do go above that um, limit. However, after talking to many of our advisors, they feel that since we pre created a device with 3D printing, if we improved our engineering qualities of making our device, we can definitely shift that error to the lower spectrum. Uh, in the future, our first step that we're looking to move on to is uh, achieving all of our signal processing on the Android platform. Currently, we're using a MATLAB-based system to analyze our signal, and uh, we want to move over to a mobile platform as soon as we can. Next, we want to make that user interface um, more efficient for the actual people looking at it. So right now, they have to wait for the test to be um, complete before the analysis begins. Uh, however, we're looking into having the graph generated live as the test occurs uh, as a next step. Next, we want to get an oscillator that can be taken apart and cleaned in between tests. Uh, we've had oscillators that are separable before, but the problem is that the, uh, the integrity of the oscillations was uh, reduced from a solid device. So we're looking next to make one that is both separable and also maintains the integrity of the oscillations. Uh, next, we're looking to send our these, these prototypes back to India for further testing and understand the sanitation, durability, and calibration preferences of our users. And if all this goes well, we're looking to expand into the first world, into the developed world, as an, and market ourselves as an in-home monitoring device for lung functioning. We would like to thank all of our advisors for helping us reach places we never would have been able to reach before. Uh, thank you for your time. We will now yield to questions.
So uh, in the beginning of our project, that's what we thought was kind of happening. But eventually we realized that the device itself is not a whistle sort of device. It's actually listening to the air hitting the microphone. So if you had a 200 frequency signal from our device, that would mean that every second the air hits our microphone 200 times, but it's not actually creating a tone of 200 hertz. Yeah. Thank you. How do you plan to sterilize or keep the inside of the device clean? Um, so we were, we've had devices, we actually have one with us that, are, that can separate into two clean pieces and you can see the insides of it perfectly. So you would like clean that out with a chlorine based solution or other solutions that we're also looking into to uh, get rid of any viruses or under bacteria that are inside the device. Uh, the only problem with that is that the oscillations that we get from that device are a little bit reduced because the air leaks out of the sides right now. Um, but it, we, don't, we don't think it'll be extremely challenging for us to make one that can be taken apart and also maintain its, um, its perfect seal of air. Okay, one last question. Um, so we weren't looking too much into making a disposable device. I think one of our goals was actually to have a reusable device just because um, we felt that it would be able to be cleaned and cut costs rather than having a uh, waste product at the end of every trial. But if we were to make one, I suppose it wouldn't be a horrible challenge to make a disposable device. I just don't see the edge it would create for our device. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much.